My name is Chris, and today we're going to be talking about pediatric necrotizing enterocolitis. This is a slide set, slide set that I used with one of my fellow students, so Asante Sana for letting me use her slides in conjunction with mine. So to start off, uh, NEC is a GI illness, specifically in the neonatal period. Uh, the full form, stage 3, is characterized by a full thickness destruction of the intestinal wall. The majority of cases are associated with preterm infants, so below 36 weeks. And uh, the statistics are that 1 in 5% of all preterm infants below 1,500 Gs will develop NEC, and in conjunction, 90% of NEC occur below 1,500. The location is primarily the terminal ileum as well as the colon. And you can read some of the subsequent complications for survivors um, regarding the surgeries that have to be done in order to correct necrotizing enterocolitis. And so for the etiology of NEC, it is poorly understood, but it is believed to be a multifactorial cause, partly because of the premature bowel, as well as potential for a area of infection caused by or due to a form of immune response that the body can no longer amount to. Some of the risk factors seen within neck primarily are prematurity, followed by that is other ones that affect the blood flow to the gut, even though it is an inside-out disease where the inside of the colon is what's being affected. So you can have polycythemia, PDA, cocaine in utero, endomethacin, and respiratory distress syndrome are all common risk factors associated with it. And once again, the inside-out phenomenon is that the bacteria on the inside of the lumen of the colon are what causes the disease, not necessarily a vascular approach where the outside is being destroyed. The diagnosis is typically within the first two weeks of life, and the presentation is kind of nonspecific, but is associated with feeding intolerance, distension, as well as bloody stools. The clinical findings that you're able to notice would be like residual gastric areas, um, absent bowel sounds, abdominal tenderness or redness, as well as bluish, color, bluish decoloration around the abdomen. Pneumatosis intestinalis and portal venous gas are two imaging that you can end up using to identify um, neck, but it's not necessarily indicative of neck. So these are some of the images associated with here, and on the left you're seeing um, pneumatosis intestinalis, which is gas inside the bowel, but compared to the picture on the right, there's actually gas in the portal vein. And it's important to know that when we're looking at these, there are a differential when we're looking at bowel thickness. So the thickened bowel wall, thick dilated loops, and peritoneal gas, these are all things that are associated with neck, but not only specific to neck. So you can also have edema, hemorrhage, or pseudotumor, or langer cell histiocytosis that can cause these issues. So it, you need to be careful that when you see this imaging, you don't necessarily jump to neck. So you're going to go and order some lab findings to better understand the prognosis of the kid. And one of the ones you're going to order is a CDC. You're going to order a Chem7 and look for evidence of DIC. The hyperglycemia, metabolic acidosis, and lactate are pretty solid lab findings. The hyperglycemia is um, kind of associated with the sepsis aspect of it. Um, I wasn't able to research more about it, but it was something that did pop up multiple times. Um, and for the CBC, once again, you're looking at the thrombocytopenia, the neutropenia, bandemia, as well as leukocytosis. So there's gonna be a lot of white blood cells, a lot of inflammation going on. The Bell's criteria is used for cases with neck. And the Bell's criteria is broken up into three basic stages. And stage two and stage three have like two separate step front offs as well. But the important thing is stage one is suspected neck. You're not sure if this is actually neck, but some of the signs kind of point you in that direction. Stage two and stage three is definite neck, where stage three being the worst form, as you can see by the perforated bowel, as well as free abdominal air under radiograph. So depending on the next staging will determine the treatment course that you're going to want to use in order to provide care to the neonate. But I want to just go first with the apnea and bradycardia are like the two classic findings that you're also going to see on clinical presentation 
for stage one suspected neck patient. When we're looking at the staging, there's different types of treatments that we're going to use for each stage. So for stage one, you're going to be putting the diet as NPO. You don't want nothing from the mouth um, because the carbohydrates can interact with the pro with the bacteria down there, and that can be a inciting event for more destruction and a further progression in the neck. You're going to start IV fluids as well as administer antibiotics from a broad to culture specific um, area. The Im imaging is going to be a baseline KUB and you're going to want to be doing serial abdominal exams in order to check to understand how the baby is progressing, whether he's going more negative or more positive. Gastric decompression is encouraged and you can probably advance the diet after three days. Stage two and stage three follow a similar pattern, except that you're going to want to keep them MPO a little bit longer. IV fluids as well as antibiotics are encouraged, but this time you're going to be learning about abdominal x-rays. And you want this two to six, eight hours, and this is to visualize the perforation. The issue here is because you know that stage three is a worse form of neck, and this is associated with abdominal perf, free, under, free air under diaphragm. So that's what you're going to want to look for. Also, the hyperglycemia portion of metabolic acidosis are going to be increasing because the bacteria are going to be causing more effects and you're going to have more thalassemia. Once again, you're going to also have serial abdominal exams for gastric decompression. And if improved, you want to advance the diet in three days. This is a little bit iffy, but uh, use it at your own discretion. Some preventative measures have been seen as use of human milk. Um, when you use human milk, there's a good interaction between the colostrum as well as the nutrients as with the baby's bacterial environment in the gut. This is important because this allows lactobacillus to grow there instead of a more harmful bacteria called proteobacter. Um, there's also some other evidence about oral antibiotics, IVs, and steroids that can be preventive measures and some probiotics that might be beneficial. I have not been able to find any actual research regarding the benefits of probiotics preventing neck, though there was a recent pu paper published in Hong Kong, I think that actually kind of alluded to this, where probiotics was given and it helped reduce the frequency of neck. But it doesn't actually end up treating neck, and that's kind of the point I wanted to make. Uh, when you have neck, the probiotics might help the transition from stage two to stage three, but that was pretty much it. So I hope this was a kind of informative, it was just a small conversation about pediatric neck that I had to give for my class and I kind of wanted to share along with everyone else. Thank you for listening.